October 19, 2022. <clears throat> this is a really great night for the Academy of Entrepreneurs and Associates because we get to graduate another class tonight uh, after 14 hours of getting to know each other in seven consecutive weeks, creating friends and understandings about what other people are going through, uh, trying to get their businesses started. So it is indeed a, a, a happy night for me, and I want to welcome everyone on board. Uh, so happy to have you. This is kind of special, too, because tonight is number 999, and tomorrow night will be 1,000. So if you are just on board for opening up the 1,000 mark with me tomorrow night, you'll be welcome to uh, join us back again for sure. So I'm excited about that as well. Uh, we got a lot to talk about tonight. I want to always remind you that I'm not a lawyer and not a tax advisor or a CPA, just here to offer you some free advice. Always the first advice is bounce your ideas and your business plans and any heavy duty decisions you got that's going to affect your security of yourself or your business or your family. Find somebody and talk to them about them. The worst mistake we can make is not getting a second opinion. So a good place to get this second opinion is your small business center. I'm very serious about that. And, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, John Hardison over in, in um, Warsaw and uh, Bart Rice and Clinton, the closest ones to you, <clears throat> would love to have a sit-down meeting and talk about your business. It'll be confidential. And they're just going to be just like employees in your business. They're, they're going to be there to help you. So think about uh, making that appointment in the next few weeks, or at least you get to meet them, tell them about your business, and tell them thank you for sponsoring these series. Tell them thank you for me, because I certainly appreciate them for sure. <clears throat> you know the rules about the chat board. <clears throat> uh, everyone on board uh, right at this point in time, I think we've got your email addresses and you're getting email from you. But if you have any comments, please add them right in the chat board right there. <clears throat> so bite off this force. Okay, let's see. 18 stars. 18 of you have uh, uh, been on board with us. Uh, the two series on Wednesday and Thursday nights. I think we started out with 23, and that's pretty amazing that we've uh, 18 of you have decided to, to see it through, and so I'm so proud of you, and we'll talk about each one of you a little bit as we go. Charmin's been with us uh, uh, through the series, and she's going to be an online reading tutor. Uh, she's pretty much just getting cranked up, but so proud of her for attending. Heather is going to be in the beeswax candle business and more. She's been with us on a pretty regular basis on uh, Thursday nights. Crystal, here you are. We are still looking for you and looking forward to great things with your candle business <clears throat> and letting us know when we can start placing those orders because several of us are ready to spend some money with you. Ron and Christopher have been with us on a regular basis. Thank you, Ron. You've been aboard on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights, and so glad to have you. And so happy to see uh, some... Um, action for you and to get the quiz. Uh, I know you've already finished your quiz, uh, so you're you're ready to go with that. Sent me a new uh, marketing tool that y'all put together. This looks great. That's the kind of stuff you want. I want to encourage you to go ahead and start using that on Facebook. Let's get a video to go with it so you can send it out and you'll see your business start improving it right away. Denisha, we're looking forward to watching your business grow during the uh, travel months and uh, Making progress, let me know if we can help you in any way. Amelia has been with us back and forth, and certainly for the work that she's doing in the financial consulting business. Darlene has been with us on a regular basis, and she has passed her quiz uh, 100%, uh, and they're going to start a pre owned business, uh, pre owned car sale business. Cheryl, there you are. Welcome again from Wilmington for your event planning business. Looking forward to getting your quiz. If you can, send it in. I don't think I've gotten it yet. And uh, I think you have sent me some information on your profit centers. But if I can help in any way, let me know. And so Rita's always on board. She finishes her quiz, and she's working on some really good-looking certificates for all of you right now. We've already passed the drafts, and uh, as soon as I can get your names and addresses to put on them, we'll them printed up and mailed to you, or maybe I can deliver them to you in person. Um, 
Angela, she needs to be in her prayers, in our prayers, her and her husband. Her husband's not been feeling good recently, and she wanted to take a little sabbatical on attending all the uh, all the events, but uh, she's passed her quiz several times, so she's a master and will always get a certificate in advance. So our prayers are with you, Angela, and hope things go well. Lisa has uh, been with us all along, and she's with us right now. Congratulations, Lisa on being a certified QuickBooks Pro Advisor. So big round of applause for uh, uh, Lisa that just came through this week. That's a major step for opening doors for you, so we're really all proud of you and pulling for your business as well. This is a good place for me to mention that what Lisa will be able to do is to help you get your QuickBooks set up. Uh, as we talked about uh, the other night on what bookkeeping can do for you, she she know how to pull up the charts and and to focus on the things in your business that you want to monitor, so that every month when you hit the button or any time when you want to hit the button and get a report out, uh, you can make make your QuickBooks do a whole lot more than just telling you how much you owe it in a month on taxes and payroll. So keep that in mind. I'm so glad we got someone on board right now with Lisa and Benson that can help us do that. I've also got a, a QuickBooks Pro in Clinton uh, that uh, has been all over Eastern North Carolina helping folks. So, Lisa, I hope I can get some trips out of town and help you make some money because that's a, a great service you're going to be providing. Katherine is uh, active in her business at Perfect Touch Online. And Madison, uh, 100%, congratulations to you. Uh, Got a website, uh, working on the website, passed the quiz, done the done the mission and vision statements, uh, uh, profit centers, done it all, and now working really serious on your uh, on your business plan and uh, uh, working on an appointment with the small business center director over at Pinehurst at Sand Hills, which is closest to him. So, and thank you for that great picture, I'm asking. That's it. One. Uh, one fine-looking soldier, and we're certainly proud of your service and, uh, and say thank you for that. Congratulations for all you're doing. We hope your business goes great. Tara is with us tonight. I'm so happy with him. Uh, Lee's Boys Transport, uh, getting his own trucking business started in a few months, uh, sometime next year. He is on board with us tonight, so thank you so much for uh, traveling all over the uh, southern United States and, and uh, carrying our, our webinars uh, to the far reaches of the south. Way to go. Julia's uh, been with us uh, all through, and her dog treats are going well. I want to tell you that my, my Otis is loving him. Uh, Patrice has done well. Uh, she's got her quiz all passed, and uh, just a great lady, and she's going to do really well with this business. And I hope we can all get together. Wouldn't that be nice? All of us uh, take a cruise. Let me tell you, if I win the lottery, if I win the lottery, I could do that, Patrice. I could just uh, have you to book us all a trip somewhere. We could just have some fun for a few days. Uh, promise. No webinars, no seminars. We just get to and enjoy learning about each other and our families. Uh, Beth, uh, thank you. You've been our, our star of this uh, series. Uh, great attitude, perfect on your quiz, sharing the video with us, and and letting us uh, use your video to show everyone how how quickly and inexpensively that you can turn a raw video that you do right at home into actually a commercial. So thank you for uh, working with us and doing that. Tisha's been with us all along. She's over in Magnolia. Congratulations, Tisha, on your quiz and 100% uh, on that. Also, she developed a business card this week and is sharing it with us. So I'm uh, looking forward to Tisha growing her business right along. So that's kind of the rundown of the uh, of the ball team. We all need to get off the bench and out on the playing field. In other words, let's get in the game, okay? Let's get in the game and uh, start it right now. So it's been a pleasure working with you. And I want to tell you, I want to continue working with you and watching your businesses grow because we're just getting started. We're just getting started. Uh, you got some really good stuff, guys, this time. I hope you'll look them over. The, your quiz, if you hadn't seen it, it is in there. And last week I sent you a quiz with the answers. So all you got to do is open up this quiz, uh, write the answers in there, go back and refer. I want you to make 100. You can look at the, uh, at the list of answers and cut, type them right in or paste them right in, and that'll be just fine. But down at the bottom, 
uh, I've asked you, the last question is, tell us how we can improve this series. That's, that's really important because in January, we'll start up another seven-part series. Uh, matter of fact, another ten-part series like we're doing uh, over seven plus five, uh, like we're doing this fall. But we have the... Uh, 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 we want to make changes that will suit you. So there were some areas that I need to improve on, that I need to spend more time on and, uh, uh, and do a better job with. Uh, for example, doing business as the definitions of that and offer some, some uh, different perspectives on that. Beth brought it to my attention that, uh, that I needed to imp improve that uh, presentation to include uh, certain aspects that I didn't touch. And I agree with that 100% and plan to do that uh, uh, in the next series uh, when we're talking about marketing because it is so important and, uh, and looking forward to that. But if you have some areas that I can uh, uh, change my presentation or recommend to John that we add to the series, please please let me know. And down at the bottom of the quiz while you're thinking about all this stuff is a, is a good place to do that. We are starting a new series, which you haven't recognized that already. Uh, we had our first one last night, and then for the next four Tuesday nights, uh, we'll have uh, uh, some stuff that you hadn't seen before or some areas that we did have in the series that we're going to jump into a whole lot deeper. So this is graduation night tonight. We're going to talk about record keeping, depreciation, taxes, and selling secrets. Uh, these first three subjects I've talked about for the last uh, last night, and I'll be doing it tonight and tomorrow night. So you're welcome to join all of them, but you will have some repetition. But I do want you to stick around tonight until the end uh, for the selling secrets because that's something you hadn't seen before, and I think you'll find it very, very helpful. So completing those assignments. Uh, if you complete the quiz and you attended the, uh, the, uh, uh, the events that we've had for the last uh, five out of the last seven, uh, you're going to qualify to get your completion uh, certificate. Uh, we've already got those. And if you do some of the other homework and send it in, you'll get a graduation certificate. And if you go to the extra mile, we'll have a special award for you. So looking forward to seeing what you send in to me. Uh, very nice achievement awards that uh, Sarita has fixed for us. This is the national one, the one we're doing for this class. We we'll always do a different one for each class. So as you hang them up on your board through the years, uh, the, the uh, awards will be different and should be quite colorful. But thank you, Sarita, for doing great work with those. Remember, study those drill skills. In one way, you will get an extra achievement award if you take those drill skills and write in uh, on your own how they will affect you and your business. Now, maybe you won't have time to get all this done next week, but even through the holidays, if, if you can do any of these and send it to me, uh, on just homework, even if it comes in late, we can print you up a, a, a graduation certificate and send it to you. Let's talk about uh, record keeping first. Taxes and running your business is all about keeping good records. And maybe you hadn't had to do that before because you hadn't owned your business. But now you don't have customers who will want to come back and review their records, ask a question about what they did last time they were with you or two years ago. And it's very common for, for a relative of a customer to call me and ask me, what was the serial number on that tractor my daddy bought 15 years ago? Uh, so you'll find that in any kind of continuing business, whatever it is, People will always want to look back to the history for one reason or another if it's just for the simple fact to find out what check number they used on a bill that they paid you or what type of oil do you put in this particular model uh, lawnmower that I sold to you. Record keeping is always going to be a sincere and uh, serious part of, of doing business. Now, in today's world, of course, computers have pretty much taken over. But you know what? I'm looking at my desk here, and it's got more paper on it than it ever has. And I'm looking at two computer screens over here, and they're full of information as well. So the information is still stacking up. So have a way to store neatly and file your paperwork as well as your computer files. And there's a lot of different ways to do it now with flash drives and offset stories. There are companies that you can hire that will download your computers every day and back back it up with all the work that you've done. But you know what? 
I think you already knew that, but here's what you maybe hadn't thought about. Uh, you're just ready to move into doing business full time, and you don't find yourself in front of a computer screen more than you ever dreamed that you could live through. I, I do that. And therefore, what you'll find out is that the human nature of not being used to doing this, you'll hit the wrong keystroke on your key, keyboard and erase everything that you've done for the last three hours. Or maybe you've been working on something two days on a file and the wrong you'll hit the wrong button and it'll be gone. Or you're right in the middle of a long project and you're making a lot of progress and things are just going really well and the power will glitch, it'll go off, you get a flash on, and when the computer comes back on, you've lost your work. Please, please, please get used to saving your work every few minutes. Uh, get used to just letting your finger, your thumb, or your, whichever finger you hit that save button with, get used to saving your work as you do it on a regular basis. And if you're in your Word file or your other type of files, if you can put a, a system in the software that is automatically saving your work as you go, I suggest you do that. Now, I can't tell you how to do that, but there are a lot of people that can, and uh, so let's find out the answer. I just hit the save button on what I'm doing. But uh, do it. Do it. It'll save yourself a lot of frustration, a lot of work to save those records as much as you can. Next, if you're going to keep your paperwork, keep it at a place that is high, and dry because you know we got changing weather periods here and we, we normally put those heavy boxes down on the cement floor because they're heavy to lift but here's the rest of the story the cement floor collects moisture even if it's not in a floodplain so if you got a, 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 a pasteboard box sitting on a cement floor it will soak up the moisture out of the floor and the cement will soak up the moisture out of the dirt around it so it all ends up going into your records so try to keep your uh, your boxes up off of the floor, first of all. And if you've got a storage place that's in a flood a flood zone or, or, or it's apt to flood in a, in, in a real heavy rainstorm or hurricane, think about moving it somewhere else. Then think about putting it somewhere where it's very, very low likelihood that it ever come in, involved with a electricity or a fire uh, so it will burn. So. It gets down to it that if you're renting a storage building somewhere, a metal storage building, or you got one in your yard, make sure it's up high, and that's a good place to keep your extra paperwork because it's usually dry in them, and you usually don't have electricity there or water that will start a fire, and as long as you're keeping it dry, you're probably going to be safe. You need to protect those records. Some of them are permanent records that you'll want to keep inside in the safe maybe, but most of them are just plain old paperwork that uh, you need to keep in boxes because of taxes. That's the reason that you're doing it. <clears throat> there are those records that you're going to keep forever because you can't replace them. And you don't have to prove someday that you own something or that you purchase something. So some of those records are your articles of incorporation, audit reports, your stock uh, uh, stock certificates for your company, deeds and mortgages we have to keep, and of course, titles to vehicles, year-end reports from our accountant, and our all of our tax returns. You want to keep your tax returns permanently for as long as as long as you can. Hey, Katharina, glad to have you on board. We've uh, been talking about you a little bit. Glad you were able to join us. And Tisha, good to have you along with us too. Uh, so other things you want to keep are your trademark registrations, but mainly your tax returns and your accountant's reports. Then there are, are those items now that we want to keep for seven years. Seven years is the law. Steve's rule is eight years. Uh, uh, I'll keep my records, all my records, for at least eight years. And the reason eight instead of seven, because after each year you file and box up your stuff, Several months later, you'll get something in the mail that was really a part of last year's tax return or tax information, and you're not going to go get it off the shelf and unbox everything. What I do is I just put it on the top of this year's work, and I just box it up with it. It was not important enough for me to call the accountant or anything, but I just wanted to save it. So I'll keep my stuff for, for, uh, for eight years. 
the main thing I want to mention to you out of this is always keep your shipping receipts. If you're uh, if you're selling products and charging sales tax, a bill of lading is a shipping receipt where you're shipping something to someone else. <clears throat> the reason you want to keep it is when it comes to paying sales taxes, there's some situations that if you're shipping a product out of state that you won't have to charge North Carolina sales tax, which is good, gives you a sales advantage over other people. And there's other items that you do supposed to charge sales tax for. But if you, when you're audited for a sales tax audit, they're going to look at uh, why you didn't pay a North Carolina sales tax on a certain invoice. And if that reason is because you shipped it out of state, then you're going to need to have a bill of lading to prove it. Also, you might not charge sales tax because the people you're selling to, uh, uh, and this would be uh, really Im important to folks like Darlene, uh, buying and selling used cars, the person you're selling it to may have a resale exemption. In other words, I'll buy it from you, but I don't have to pay you sales tax because I don't sell it to someone else. And when I sell it to someone else, I'll collect a tax for it. Well, you don't have to prove to the uh, auditor that this person had a North Carolina exemption. And if you can't prove it, you don't have to pay that tax. Okay? So resale uh, exemptions or maybe farmers, maybe they have a farm exemption or a manufacturer's exemption. There's lots of ins and outs on different things you'll sell, and you need to save those documents for at least uh, uh, eight years in case you have an audit to back them up. <clears throat> Another set of items that you'll want to keep for uh, at least eight years are those that are related to employee, uh, em employee records, employees that are still working with you or that have uh, gone on somewhere else. Because sometimes employees will go on somewhere else and have some type of health issue or an accident, and they go to the hospital and they say, well, this is a workman's claim thing because I first got hurt when I was working for Steve. So they will automatically, they be in the hospital and the state will automatically charge your unemployment insurance account for that injury, even though they don't work for you anymore. And maybe... Maybe they weren't really injured when they worked for you, and the way you prove that is with your records, and you'll have to have them to prove it, okay? That doesn't happen often, but it can, it does, and when it does, it can cost you some real bucks. You want to keep up with all your tax returns, your invoices to your customers, and the invoices that you paid. So both sides of that, the invoices that you paid you need to keep, and invoices where you charge customers you need to keep. Now, remember on the invoices we talked about last week in bookkeeping, those invoices are best if you can keep them in chronological order by the number of the invoices and also keep them stored in a way that you can easily go down the dates and go down the numbers and just pull out the little box or package that you need instead of having to search through all of them to find out this one or that. So keep it organized chronological and by invoice numbers. You want to keep your records where you can get to them in case uh, after a fire or a storm or, or, or a hurricane. That's why you want to keep them safe because that's when you'll need them for your insurance company, uh, filing your claims, and also if you have a claim with the FEMA, with the U.S. government, because I'll tell you that if you have, we have a bad hurricane or flood here uh, or your business gets wiped out uh, uh, and it qualifies as a disaster area, uh, FEMA can come in and the, and the uh, SBA, Small Business Association, can come in and offer you maybe some, some uh, grants or maybe even some very low interest uh, lo loans to help you get your business back up and running. And if that's the case, they're going to need to see your records, what you've been doing, so you can document who you are, where you are, and, and all the information. So remember that if a, if a hurricane's coming, and we hear this on the TV, Put your records in a safe place so that you can find them so they won't get blown away or wet because you may need them to file claims after the storm. All right, that's that's enough for record keeping. Pretty much just common sense, right? Let's talk about depreciation now. Now, I, I know all about appreciation because I appreciate you guys. Yeah, we all appreciate things, right? And what does appreciate mean? Appreciate means that things are looking up. 
values are going up. I think more of you now than I did before. I am appreciating you a lot. So that's the truth now, but we're going to move it and take that A off that word and move a D up there and talk about depreciation. And we've heard of depreciation before, mainly when we talk about cars and trucks and tools or something getting old and used. It is depreciating in value. As something gets older, as something is more worn out, as something is broken, usually it depreciates in value. Now, of course, there's some things that appreciate just as they get older because they become rare as long as they're taken good care of. But we're after depreciation tonight. Understanding depreciation is kind of simple because it just is simply that when something gets older, it's not worth as much. But when we are trying to apply the, all the ands, ifs, and buts about depreciation into our financial statement and how it affects our business and, more importantly, how it affects our taxes, we need to pay attention a little bit. So there, there is so much to, to talk about with depreciation that there's no way we could cover it in a 25-minute segment here in this uh, seminar. But I did search the Internet, and I found the best uh, one-hour read, one hour, from Lisa Borga, and it's a handout that, that's been mailed to you. She tells about depreciation in a way that's fairly easy to understand, and it's going to be a really important read for you. I want to encourage you to take the time to browse through that and pick up what you can. I'll let some of it sink in, because as you go down the road, it's going to be good for you to have a basic knowledge of depreciation. You're going to hire an accountant who knows all about appreciation, depreciation. That's why we need, need, to, uh, need accountants, which we'll talk about later tonight. So this depreciation handout that has been sent to you can be very valuable, so please pay attention to it, read through it when you can. But you and I now are going to go through the basics, and I will give you some examples of how it may approach, uh, uh, affect you. Read your definition here simply. Depreciation is a reduction in the value of an asset with the passage of time or due to wear and tear. Just makes sense, right? Just like we just said. Uh, items that are really expensive like machinery and tractors and cars and sewing machines and uh, computers and, and things, as they get older, they, they, they wear and, and they lose some of their value. But companies have to keep up with your company and my company businesses have to keep up with what what our asset values are so that we'll know what our net worth is, not only for our own information, but also for that of uh, creditors or and or lenders. So let's have a, a couple of, uh, uh, I'll fix a, some examples here that I think will help you hold on to what we're talking about. Let's say that right now you've got $10,000. Congratulations. All right. I'm proud of you. You got 10,000 cash greenbacks in the bank. And that's a good thing. Your business right now is worth $10,000. You got that in that business account, right? 10 smackaroos. So you need, uh, you need to buy a saw. Let's say you're in the cabinet business and you need to buy a saw to make tables and cabinets and such as that. And the industrial saw that you need to buy is $5,000. You've done your negotiation. You found some for $10,000 and $12,000, but you negotiated and you worked hard and you saved yourself $5,000, and now you're ready to purchase that new saw for $5,000. So the question is, if I take that $5,000 out of the bank and buy that saw, does that mean that the value of my company goes down 50% to $5,000 because I still don't have that $10,000? What do you think? The answer is no. Because on the day you buy that new saw, it's worth $5,000, and you still got five grand in the bank in cash, so that is a total of $10,000, and it's still a company asset. But now the asset is a depreciated item, and a capital cash uh, uh, deposit in the bank. Two different types of assets, but still $10,000 value is there on the first day. But the reason we have to talk about depreciation is 
on the second day, the third day, and as that saw gets older, whether it's used or not, just because it is older, it starts losing value. So tomorrow your business is going to be worth $9,998, okay? Not 10000 anymore, and it's going to continue to go down. So how are we going to put something in place to help us keep up with that? And, you know, I I had that $10,000 in the bank, and, and now I don't have it, but I needed that saw, and now I'm going to be penalized uh, for buying that saw because I had to pay the sales tax on it, and uh, and it's going to start going down in value. So what what in the world is, is, is going to happen? Why would I want to buy the saw? Because it's, it's really, maybe I've been better to rent it or borrow it from somebody. Well, the government and the country at whole want us to help small businesses get started and, and entrepreneurs get started and help our manufacturers or United States manufacturers. So the Congress and the government encouraging people to buy things to keep the economy going, to help our manufacturers and to help reduce your cost. Uh, they said that we can depreciate the items that we buy. In other words, we don't have to pay all the tax on them the first year that we buy them uh, as far as our uh, paying tax on the profits that we paid for those items with. So to give us a break, a tax break, and here's the way it works. So to go back to the basics first. 10000 in the bank, 5000 in the saw, the company net worth is still $10,000. <clears> but the, but now we're going to get to depreciate it. It is a, a, a capital item. It is an asset. It's tangible. We can touch it. And the uh, we need to put it into our book system, and we put it into our books on our depreciation sheet. Uh, on your financial statement and on your tax returns, there will be a depreciation sheet where you list down all the assets, all the tangible assets of your company. And it, we're going to say that on this particular item on this saw, that there is a five-year write-off option. These options are changed sometimes. Sometimes you can write everything off in one year or five years or three years or seven years or ten years. Maybe even longer, I don't know. But but we're going to say that this saw has a five-year write-off period. And remember, it cost us $5,000. So we're going to put it onto our books on a five-year write-off, which means that the first year it's on the books, $5,000. Second year, $4,000. Third year, $3,000. In other words, it's coming down $1,000 a year. And at the end of five years, after the fifth year, We'll take that last $1,000 value off, and it's going to be on our books. That you saw still going to be there, but at a zero value, or a $1 or a $100, a salvage value. All the way down, it's going to come down. So we're saying that we're going to be truthful about this. We know our company is, is, is not as worth as much the day that saw was uh, new as it is the day it's five years old, right? So we, we're honest about that. But we have to do it and call that book values. Another part of the story here is that we'll talk about in a minute is fair market value. That even though that saw is valued at zero on your books, on your depreciated item, it may still be worth four thousand bucks. But we're gonna bring it down as far as book value, we're gonna call it a thousand. That's got a plus and minus effect on it, which we'll get to now. The depreciation plan is helping that saw, even though our, our our value, our book value is coming down each year, guess what? That saw is not only cutting wood for you, but it's making money for you another way because as that de depreciation value comes down, it is lowering your tax exposure because that $1,000 that you took off the value of the, of the saw, it came directly off also your tax exposure. Yeah. So each year, because you bought that saw, you're going to owe money on $1,000 less money than otherwise. So it's going to make you $5,000 again and saving you money. 
that's pretty serious pretty serious uh, reason to think about purchasing something because you get a double payoff on it <clears throat> so remembering now that as you buy items you can save money on depreciation and I'll always say that you have to spend money to make money but I got to give you a a, a a a cautionary note here don't let people say you need to go out and buy a new car or a new truck or a new saw or a new computer so you don't have to pay as much tax. Even though you may not have to pay as much tax, first of all, you've got to be profitable before you pay tax anyway. So if you're making a lot of money and you are have to pay a lot of taxes out, there's a good chance that advice is good. But if you're just breaking even, there's a good reason not to go buy a new truck to save money on it. There's a real good reason to stay with a used truck, which you still will be able to depreciate, but at a lot, lot less value. If you're making a decision what to buy, new, used, expensive, or inexpensive, based on trying to avoid pay taxes, the person you need to talk to is not to Steve. It's not to the guy down the street who knows all about everything. It's not to a bookkeeper, usually you need to talk to a CPA. That's right. That's what I need to do and what you need to do. Before you spend money uh, on, on large items to save money on taxes, talk to a CPA. Let's talk about taxes in general now. The CPAs have told me through the years when I asked them in this lesson tonight, what is one thing I should definitely mention to all my friends and associates? And they all say, all 12 of them have said, like it was in the book, the first thing you need to encourage them to do, Steve, is to pigeonhole tax money. It's not to get caught by surprise that first year you're in business because it is so easy to do. So as you're making sales and you're taking in money or, you're, or you are paying payrolls and you're paying out the salary and you got through that all right, but you forgot to set aside the unemployment insurance and the Social Security tax, and that 12 to 18% extra money above payroll that you have to set aside as an employer, then you don't find yourself in trouble. So always keep in mind, as you're bringing in money and paying out salaries, pigeonhole your tax money because it's got to go. And if you don't pay it on time, they will shut you down. They will charge you a lot of interest and a lot of penalties, and it'll hurt. So know where you're headed with that. And as someone was saying earlier, one of the worst mistakes you can make is get your business up and running before you have enough money to cover your taxes or know that you've got the cash flow coming in to do what you need to do. So learn to pigeonhole the money. We don't have to determine what our business expenses are, and we don't call them different things. Uh, uh, our, our business expenses are the basis for our deduction. But there are some deductions that we're going to take as just normal business expenses like payroll and rent, uh, toilet paper and, 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 and uh, oil that we change in our car. And then there are other items that are not just general expenses, but they're money that you spent to buy assets, hard assets like tools and trucks and cars and things like that things that will last a while. Those items that, are, that will become your assets, we're going to capitalize them. The word is capitalized. We're going to change them into a fixed asset. And we're going to enter our fixed assets, list them down one by one, and what we paid for them and the date we paid for them on our depreciation sheets. That's right. Every business does this. All of us will. So a Madison who's going to be in the computer uh, hosting business, uh, internet hosting business, he's going to be buying lots of servers. So all his servers and electrical gear, that will be his assets, okay? Uh, uh, Teresa will be buying trucks and trailers, and they'll be his assets. And Beth may be buying certain types of office furniture or medical instrumentation. That will be her assets. Uh, Patrice will have a nice office for her travel business and her furniture and fixtures will be her fixed assets. And 
Crystal will be buying equipment to put her candle making business up and running. And Cheryl may be buying lots and lots of, of tables and tablecloths and candelabras for her uh, 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 event planning business and rental business. So all of us will have different things that we'll use in our business. In my business, I used to have a world of trucks and trailers and tools and I mean, the, the uh, fixed asset list was a long, long way, including uh, uh, different types of special tools and things, <clears throat> parts bins, uh, display equipment. Now I'm working out of my home office, and I've got my computers and my studio equipment and my backdrops, like you see my new backdrop back here. Uh, so my list of assets has gone down. Instead of having $100,000 worth of tools, now I've probably got $5,000 worth. So things change in businesses. So that, that's the way it, that's the way it is. So, but you have to keep up with it. You want to keep up with it because the assets that you've bought and are keeping up with them, they represent the book value of your business. And the book value of your business is a place that some people will look to start determining the fair market value of your business. Two different things. But that depreciation sheet becomes very, very important. And we'll talk about that as we go along. Capital expenses are those items that don't last you a while, uh, more than a year, items that are tangible, uh, like printers and, and uh, the, uh, whether they're expensive printers or low-cost printers, uh, you, you don't keep up with those. Uh, maybe you're a small company, and that printer is one that you would capitalize. Maybe you're a large company, and that little printer, you don't want to keep up with it on your books. you got so much, so you'll expense that as you go. And you've got that freedom. You and your CPA can pretty much determine what you want to capitalize and what you want to write off. The more you write off, the less tax exposure you're going to have. The more you're able to keep on your books, the more value your company is going to show, but you don't pay you don't pay more taxes to be able to put it there. The paper that we put in printers, note that it'll never be a capital item. Tires are usually just written off unless you're a small company and a set of tires don't last you ten years. You've got the option to depreciate it if you want to, just like engines that go in trucks or tractors or whatever. But rent, when you rent a car or you rent a truck or you rent a forklift, nope. That's just a write-off. It will never be depreciated. Payroll, CPA fees, uh, a new set of shop tools. Hmm. Well, the payroll and the, and the CPA fees, that's just general expense. But a new set of shop tools are going to last you a long time. So you would want to depreciate those. Maybe you're not going to go out and just buy a new set right now. Maybe you're going to buy a new set over a period of time. Well, at the end of the year, this is when you can accumulate and put together these sets that you've got. And if you don't keep them as a set, then you can capitalize that set of tools and just list down the dates that you bought them and how much the values were when you did buy them. And then they'll become a fixed asset for you. Uh, renting, renting equipment, a lot of people are going to lease to own. And I really recommend you consider doing that as a new company. Uh, but that rent that you're paying, that's going to be a write-off for you. Delivery costs are always just generally write-offs. And maybe you've rented a truck or a forklift or a server for a long time, and you pay thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars rental, but now you've got a chance to buy it in your uh, uh, rental lease plan, and you buy it for $5,000. Well, that purchase price will be considered the asset value because that's what you paid for it when you actually bought it. And it would go on your books at five grand, even though it may be worth twenty thousand. Maybe you rented a truck for five thousand for, for twenty four months for a thousand dollars a month and then you bought it for five thousand. On your books it'll go for five thousand. But me and you both know it's probably worth around twenty grand. Again that's how you, there is a major difference in book value and fair market value. Talk about doing some taxes now. What you want to learn to know about doing your taxes is, as inexperienced entrepreneurs as you are, 
I really would like for you to find a CPA and or a bookkeeper who has some familiarity with your type business. Okay? One or the other. Or that you have someone that's close to you that's doing the same type of work that you're doing that you can talk to about the ins and outs. And while you're talking to them, ask them if they're happy with their bookkeeper or CPA. Because I don't want you going through a learning curve at the same time your CPA is going through a learning curve as well as the bookkeeper. Three learning curves are going to be hard to end up with sustainability. Someone needs to have some experience. The good news about the CPAs are before they can become a CPA, they generally have gone through a long training process and a lot, a lot of schooling. And uh, CPAs generally are experienced from day one, but that doesn't mean they're experienced in your type of business. So just be careful as you're picking those folks, okay? At the, at the IRS website, there's a link here that will help you with some of the information you'll want to consider when choosing who's going to help you. The word avoidance and the word evasion comes into play now. Tax avoidance means that you're managing your affairs in such a way to pay fewer taxes. That is not against the law, and it is a good thing for you to legally not pay the ta uh, taxes you don't have to pay. Uh, you do that by maybe you're going to wait till next year to make a purchase for tax reasons, or maybe you're going to rent or lease a piece of property or a tool or a car or a truck instead of buying it for, for tax purposes because every little thing you do and the way you do it, every little thing you do and the way you do it may have a different taxation placed on it. So choosing those methods that you're going to pay the least amount of taxes is called tax avoidance. And I want us all to enjoy doing that so we can stay in business longer and uh, end up with some money for ourselves as well. But tax evasion is an important word too. That's when folks lie, cheat, steal, hide, and actually defraud uh, the taxing agency in a blatant effort to cheat. And that those are uh, uh, that's a long way from avoidance. And when you do that, you're going to be apt to be uh, fined, arrested, maybe go to jail, have some terrific penalties, and it may keep you from staying in certain kinds of businesses. You know, there's some kind of businesses you cannot, cannot even get into if you have a felony conviction. or, or a, There's a lot of people that will not hire you to be a vendor or a contractor if you have, uh, have some tax evasion type issues. So just be careful with that. Make sure you stand on top of it. The advantage of doing business and having a CPA file your tax returns, one of the best advantages is, is a CPA, they're, sw they're sworn by oath as almost like an officer of the court or, or an officer of the treasury system not to file a claim that they, that they think there's something in there that's wrong. That's right. Not, they will not sign it. So generally, if you've got a CPA doing your tax returns, your chances of being audited go down. And the good news is if you do get audited, the CPAs will generally uh, help uh, sit there at the table with you, uh, defend your return, and most of the time they don't charge you any money in a, a simple situation. I don't want to speak for them, but through the years I found that to be the case uh, with my, my accounting firm. If you're doing business with someone that's just got a sign out in the yard and that sign says, let us do your returns and we'll guarantee you a, 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 a refund, you need to be careful there because they can't do that. Even though they put it on signs, the person doesn't know in advance whether you don't get a refund or not. But they, there's some crooks out there that have put it on a sign and encourage people to bring them returns. Now, they will get you a refund, and in the paperwork that you sign normally, they're going to get that refund before you see it, and they're going to get a, a chunk of it. Think about this when you're uh, watching TV at night, late at night. 
you see these fellows come on, these ladies come on and say, oh, I owe the IRS $50,000, and I got so-and-so taxcredit.com to help me get out of my problem. I owe the IRS $100,000. Well, a lot of those people that end up owing the IRS those kind of tremendous dollars that took their business away from them, they're the folks that they use shady preparers. So check out the person that you're entrusting that's doing your tax work, okay? Let's, let's stay away from tax evasion. What's the difference in the two words? Tax avoidance is legal. Tax evasion is not legal. Okay, it's almost November, and during November and December is when most of us, and if you don't do it, I'm going to encourage you to do it as a small business entrepreneur. These are two months when uh, when you kind of say, my priority is on, on November 1st is to start thinking about uh, summarizing my different uh, tax information. In other words, let me start getting my bills together in certain stacks in November so when the December bills come in, I can put them on top of the different stacks they belong to, add them up. So on January 1st, I'm ready to hand them over to my, my uh, tax authority or bookkeeper uh, or accountant. It's a good thing to group your paperwork, okay? And the deductions are what we're after. Why? Because the more deductions we have, the less tax exposure we have. If And that's why as an entrepreneur starting your new business, if you keep up with all your expenses, keep up with every expense that you've had, list them down, and during the first year or two, most small businesses have a hard time bringing in more money than they spent getting ready to be in business. So the chances of your tax uh, exposure being high enough that you have to pay a significant amount of tax is really low during your first two or three years. If you do have that problem, count your blessings. It's a good thing. But deductions is how we... Uh, limit the amount of tax money we have to pay. And we, we do that by determining what they were and whether or not they qualify as a deduction. These are the items on the list here that we're going to talk about that are in front of you that are the normal groups of deductions. Uh, home office, travel, business car use, interest, rent, taxes, insurance, uh, business-related training, clothes, and uniforms. These are the ones that most folks will have maybe a deduction in, and we have to itemize those. The ones that cause most people the most problems are uh, home office deductions and travel. Okay, so I'll, I'll spend some extra time on those. Uh, the use of your car always gets in a, a lot of conversation. But interest that you pay as a business, all your rent, taxes that you're paying, insurances that you have to buy, business-related training and, uh, and education costs, and clothes and uniforms, pretty much you just list them down. As long as they're not out, here, out of sight, you're not going to have any trouble claiming those as a deduction and lowering the amount of money you had, uh, have to pay taxes on. But it's kind of hard to determine how much the deduction is if you're using a home office deduction. If you're operating your business from inside your house, and then you are a, a home-based business, and you need to determine where in your house is your office and how, how much space is taken up. Because you will be able to consider deducting the percentage of space that you're using as an office compared to your total house uh, size. Let's say you're renting a condo with 1,000 square feet. And you've, you've separated off over here. You, you put your desk in, or two desks in the corner, and you're using up 10 square feet uh, in your den area, in your open area. So 10 square feet compared to a, a thousand, I mean 100 square feet, 10 by 10, 100 square feet compared to 1,000 square feet total is saying that you're using 10% of your condo space as an office. And if your condo expenses are $1,000 a month, then you would be writing off $100 a month office expense deduction. See how that works? 
You compare the percentage of your space versus your expenses. And in that situation, your expenses will be your rent, your upkeep, your roof, your water, your electricity, uh, your carpet, uh, what it takes. So you would add all those household expenses up, take 10%, and use that as a, as a business deduction. Okay? But that gets kind of tricky sometimes because maybe it's hard to determine how actually big your office is and come up with a number. So I'm going to encourage you to give some consideration that if you can come up with an outside building, an outside office, a detached garage, some other way to determine a structure outside the house that you can call your office, put a little sign on it, and, 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 and actually conduct your business in it, whether or not it's got a bathroom or not, that's not imperative. But then you will be able to say, all right, that's my building out there, and I'm, that's my office, and I don't rent it to my company. My individual self is going to rent that office out there to my company. And each month, my company will write me a check. Rent. I don't have a contract. I don't have a rental agreement. And they don't pay me every month. And I don't keep up with that, that, that money. The money they give you for rent is will come to you personally as taxable income. But it will come away from the company as an expense. So it'll be a deduction for the company, a rental expense, you see. And generally that is a very good situation because instead of dealing with keeping up with all these little percentages of space inside your house, you can have a fixed monthly rental, no questions asked. Now, in my business, I've been renting my office here to my to my companies for uh, 15 years, maybe even 20, for $625 a month. Every month, my company writes a check to me for $625. That's personal income to me, but it's a business expense to the company. It got, I hadn't had a bit of trouble with that, and I'd be surprised if you did either. It's worked out good. Travel. You don't have to make a decision whether or not you're better off to own your vehicle or if your company needs to own the vehicle. And for a company, a new company, getting started owning a vehicle, some, that means going to the bank and borrowing money as a company, which can be complicated. And you don't uh, then insure it uh, with the insurance company as a company instead of individually. If it's a company vehicle, uh, as an individual, you don't worry about the expenses. The company pays all the bills. But the very minute that you start driving that vehicle for your personal use, even driving back and forth to work, which is called commuting, or it's a company vehicle, but I'm going to take it on vacation and do all my, all my personal stuff with it. When you get company owns the vehicle and you're using it, then you're obligated to pay the company for the use of that vehicle because you're benefiting from it. So that's the downside for it. The upside is that usually companies that have uh, lots of vehicles uh, get fleet discounts on on um, on your insurance, and you save a lot of money uh, by doing that. On the other hand, if you just say have if all you don't need is a regular car or a pickup or a van, just one vehicle, uh, not a fleet, then usually you're better, and it's not something really special or expensive, then you're usually better off to own the vehicle yourself. Have it in your name, have the insurance in your name, uh, this and that, and whatever, just make sure you got yourself covered with your insurance company with what all you're doing. Uh, but... Then you pay all the bills. You pay the the interest on it, the loan on it, the car payment. You buy the tires. You pay for the oil and and and, uh, and and repairs when they're needed. You do all that out of your pocket. But every mile that you are using that vehicle for company work, every mile that you're using the vehicle for company work, you'll be get reimbursed by your company. And I think the rate now is 54 and a half cent per mile. So for every 100 miles that you drive the vehicle doing company work, the company pays you back in cash. The company pays you monthly 
$54.50. And you take that $54.50 and you pay your car payments, you buy the gas bill, you do all the expenses because the company is only paying you for the mileage. Got it? Usually with just a, a really nice used car or a used pickup truck, uh, usually that uh, per diem amount of 50 some cent a mile will help you own it and trade it in and keep you something uh, dependable. And uh, as the cost of vehicles go up and as the cost of fuel goes up, the different states will amend uh, this, uh, uh, this mileage rate to, accordingly to make it work. They have to do that because this is the same way that the federal government does with uh, with with, uh, with federal cars and, and such as that to uh, compensate people that are are using their own their own vehicles for uh, all types of work. So generally, you'll come out good. But here's here's what you need to do. You don't have to keep a log. You don't have to show where you're going and and uh, and, and when the company owes you some money. You don't have to document why they do. Now, the last thing I want to mention now is the insurance. All of y'all are young. Every one of you I, I see here are, are, are fairly young folks. Uh, you're uh, 50 years younger than I am probably. And I want to tell you that as owner of your company, life insurance can become an important incentive and perk as an owner. Uh, you, it's, it's, it's hard to come out of your tax-paid dollars to, to pay insurance premiums. I know that if you got children, and I had a bunch of them when I was coming along getting my businesses started. So my dad taught me and my good insurance agents uh, at the time, and these rules have changed through the years, so you don't need to talk to a, a good independent insurance agent to, to, to guide you through this and maybe your CPA. But there's a lot of variables here where there's an excellent chance that your company, right out of your company checkbook, can pay your insurance premiums on your life, on your life insurance, and also on your disability insurance. But I'm talking about life now, because with life insurance, you can get uh, whole life policies, which create cash value over a long period of time, and therefore can become a savings account as you're buying insurance. So not only will you be getting you know, uh, security and insurance and life insurance protection, for your loved ones and your debt on your business, but also start creating a savings account and the cash values of those policies. Now, if the company's paying the premium, here's kind of the catch. The company has to be the beneficiary of a life policy that it's paying for, okay? But in some situations, some states, and, and you, you don't have to check on this, that if the company is 51% beneficiary, it gets to pay 100% of the premium, and you get to name other beneficiaries, like your wife, your husband, your children, your estate. Okay. Now, of course, the money that goes to the company uh, in your death, it would be used to pay off the debts. And after the debts are paid off, then, of course, your other beneficiaries are going to get that money either way. So that you, you can work with that. But the rest of the story is, after a certain period of time, you start accumulating some age and maybe don't need quite so much life insurance policy uh, for the company or for other reasons, and you are the owner of the company, therefore you are the owner of the life insurance policy, and therefore you can sw switch the ownership of that policy to someone else. Make yourself the owner of that policy or someone else. Now, again, you got to check this through. Things change. That's just the rules when I was coming along. But the thing is that that would be a good way for you to switch the value of that uh, cash values right over to your name so that you will get the benefit of it later on without the company being involved. Just something to think about. The rules on, on these change often, but still the bottom line is life insurance with you having the company named the beneficiary in case you die, is very attractive to lenders. Because if they're going to lend you money, they're going to be always afraid that you may kick the bucket and be gone and therefore not be able to pay that loan back. And it indeed, instead of having a large chunk of collateral, 
indeed the the uh, the bank may say well you're light on collateral but we may consider doing this if you'll let the bank uh, take out a life insurance policy on your life or you take one out and name us uh, the beneficiary of it those are the kind of things that sometimes you can negotiate to help you get a better deal on a loan or even get the loan at all something to think about now also in my years in business which were always related to the equipment industry I had lots and lots of employees that we would purchase uniform service for them so they would have clean uniforms every day. And then I started doing the same thing. Uh, I always did it for the mechanics, but then we started doing it for the parts department folks and the clerks. And then started doing it for the sales team and for the office staff. I, I figured every employee was important. We needed to do it, and for me as well. So... Uh, Every, every year I would go to the store and still do and uh, two or three times a year and buy several hundred dollars worth of uh, shirts and coats and, and pants and shoes maybe, things that I would wear for work. And I would take those bills and I would itemize them and I'd put them right in my list of deductions. And as long as you don't go hog wild with that and keep it reasonable, I think you'll be just fine with it. Uh, employers have been buying uniforms, uh, services and uniforms for for their employees for ever since the beginning of keeping records. So there's no reason entrepreneurs shouldn't be given that same uh, benefit, in my opinion. So tax preparers and collectors, we talked about before, but now when you get all these bills together and you're ready to go give them to the bookkeeper, the CPA, or to your tax preparer, don't just put everything loose in a bag and hand it to them because every piece of paper an accountant has to pick up, they will itemize it. And there will be a bill related to every piece of paper. So if your pieces of paper are these summaries, if you've got a thousand receipts here and you summarize it down to three pieces of paper, oh, they're going to check off each item that you summarize, but that's going to go a whole lot quicker than analyzing and studying and thinking about every piece of paper and whether or not it counts or not. So itemize and I mean, excuse me, summarize your uh, your all the work that you can before you give it to the tax preparer. That will save you money and save you a lot of time. Plus, it will give you a good idea of where your money went. Yeah, it's okay to spend it $1 at a time. We don't really pay much attention on that. But when you sit down next month in uh, December and January, you start looking at all these bills one at a time, and you're saying to yourself, wow, maybe I could have done something different here and saved a lot of money. That's why it's kind of good for you to itemize it yourself and not ask someone else to. Who are we going to give all this money to? Well, the money's going to go out as permits and license and estimates and fees, but I like to say it's all taxes. Oh, let's just call it taxes. It's money going to the government. And I'll be one of the first to say that we need to pay our government taxes because we do need police protection. We do need our armed services uh, strong and ready to go. Man, we got to have good schools and colleges. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, we need good roads. Uh, so I'm not against paying t my, my fair share of taxes. I just want everybody to pay them, okay? But we need to do it. So the city is going to have people at the town clerk office. The town clerk is the person that's going to get your city money, your town and city. The county, each county government has a tax collector or a tax agency inside their government. North Carolina State, that agency is called NCDOR, Department of Revenue. And the federal government, of course, has got the IRS, which collects money for the U.S. Treasury. So those are the four tax entities that we all have to deal with at some point in time. And they will be involved in our, in our business. The sales and use tax is the most challenging, usually, for most small businesses, because every day when we sell something, we have to collect tax, keep up with that money, and, 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 uh, and then send it into the uh, state government, and we've got to keep up with those records. You know, they used to pay you to do that. They used to get You used to get to keep a percentage of the tax money that you collected for the state. And in some companies, that was a big, big figure. Well, I, I think they should have to pay us because we're having to spend our time to collect their money and such as that. So I, th I thought that was a good thing to do, but they did away with it. So now we just have to collect it for free for them and send it to them. And if we don't do it just right, we're penalized, 
and we also uh, are going to be charged interest for our mistakes. North Carolina, the government, I think, does all they can do to be friendly to entrepreneurs. I feel comfortable telling you that when you call the North Carolina Department of Revenue, you will probably find somebody with a smile on their face that welcomes the opportunity to serve you, even to the point that you can make uh, appointments and go meet with them at local regional offices or always go to Raleigh. Now, COVID came along and cut out a lot of personal appointments, everybody wearing masks and trying to distance themselves. But what did that bring on? More meetings like this. So I'm sure that they offer conference calls with customers. And they go to the small business centers on a regular basis and offer seminars and webinars. Again, since COVID came along, they're offering webinars all the time. And you can go to the North Carolina Department of Revenue website, check small business uh, operations, and see uh, what training that they're giving you free. Generally, those are very good. A lot of my clients, like yourself, have said through the years they were very helpful. So I recommend that you do that. Other than sales tax and use tax, we've got other types of taxes, withholding that are related to employee uh, uh, payments, uh, salaries, and, and wages, privilege license, which are license or fee that we pay to uh, uh, the, the uh, different town or county that we're located in, what's called a privilege license to do business within that area. Uh, these usually run from $25 to $200, depending on how big the business is going to be. And it's no, no serious paperwork to fill out. But when you get that privilege license, that also means that the, the, uh, the fire marshal and the planning board folks and, and the, uh, the, the people that are interested in safety uh, 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 will come by and have inspections before you can open up to make sure your plumbing's okay, your electricity is okay, and you're doing all right, everything all right with the uh, constructions that you got your permits as you were making improvements. So that all starts when you get that privilege license. It puts you in direct contact with the government and makes you a member of the team, the member of the economic team in the area. And that's good. Be positive about that. Be positive about it because when people belong to the team and have paid their dues, then that means that folks that are trying to hide uh, to hide and, and do business unscrupulously or not pay taxes or, 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 to, or, to, or not be fair with their customers and such as that, crooks and scammers, they're not going to go get a permit. Therefore, if someone is operating out there without a permit and they get turned in, then that's a good signal that, that, that they're helping you protect your business uh, uh, by keeping folks that do it, uh, shady operators, out of your territory and, and away from your family as well. Unemployment insurance is saying uh, to uh, employees that if, you, if I have to lay you off or you lose your job for some reason, that means you will be qualified for unemployment compensation. We've heard of that all along, right? Maybe from time to time you've had to draw unemployment compensation. Where does that money come from? The employers every week send in a portion of, of their money to pay a, a unemployment compensation to the state so that if that particular employee someday down the road loses their job and has to draw that stuff, it comes out, out of your account. You know, they keep up with how much money you pay into it. Also, this uh, uh, workman's compensation is, is paid, and the more dangerous a job is, the more compensation you have to pay out with each, each check that you, uh, that you have. So sometimes that will help people determine that I don't need to hire a welder to work for me full time. I'm better off to, to, to uh, have a contractor come in and do my welding because Welding is a good example of, the, of folks that you have to pay a really high uh, uh, workman's compensation uh, fee with each salary. So uh, you'll learn, the strategy will learn is, am I better off to hire a person to come in and do this work for me, or am I better off to have this to be an employee of my own? That's, that's where these come in. Understanding how all that works is important. 
You didn't know this, but congratulations. As you come into business and file tax returns, you will be a franchise. You get to pay a franchise tax. Congratulations. Well, maybe you didn't know you had a McDonald's or a Chick-fil-A. Man, I'd like to have one of those, wouldn't y'all? So I could be a franchise? No. They've got this little line on, this, on the uh, state returns and the federal returns, kind of at the end of the returns, it says franchise tax on both the state and, 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 and the uh, Fed returns, franchise tax. I think it's 100 on one and 200 on the other. And what that is is they're going to get some money from you, whether you made any money or not, or pay any other taxes. You will have to pay a franchise tax when you file a return. I just like to kind of think it's the money the IRS gets for handling all the paperwork. And they probably need to get that because these returns need to be filed. So that's a couple. That's a tax that you will pay uh, irregardless of uh, what your income was or what the condition of your business is in, whether it's worth a billion dollars or whether it's worth nothing, you still get to pay a franchise tax with each return. How about that? Now, the fellows locally, the guys over at the county seat, and each one of us at the county, they got to get paid too, right? I mean, our schools have got to operate, and our county's got to do this, and our county's got to do that, and got to keep the libraries open, and, and, uh, and, uh, all the things that counties do, indeed, water systems, they got to be paid. And businesses pay, uh, pay their share. But we don't pay as business people, we don't pay, or as individuals, North Carolina counties, based on our income. We don't pay based on our profit or loss. We pay based on what we own, our property. Yeah. We pay based on what we own. Our house, our land, our trailer, our horse, our tractor, all the things that we own, our assets, are taxed by the county. Now, the good news is, except for our vehicles, our property that we own that we talked about earlier on the depreciation sheet, is taxed based on the book value, not on the fair market value. But our real estate and our cars and trucks are taxed based on fair market value. Need to remember that. And that's how the tax bill that you get comes to you. You'll notice that your land has been appraised and it's got a value up there. That's the fair market value done by our appraiser and what they agreed on. Your automobiles and your trucks and your campers and everything related with a, a license tax, that's based on the blue book values. But all the other items in your company that are on your depreciation sheet is based on the book values that we talked about earlier. So you can't, you can't fill out your county tax return as a business person without having a depreciation sheet to go on if, if, if you've got a significant business. Okay. Now, that means that the county taxes are due to be filed before the end of January every year. Usually a business will get a, a, a county a filing document in, in December, and it'll tell you, fill these out and send it right on in because these have to be completed by the end of January. Now, if you don't send it in by that date, you don't have to pay an automatic 10% penalty on the taxes. Automatic, and there's no no arguing about it. You can't say, I didn't know, that won't count. However, if you get an extension, and you can do that right on your computer, just look at their website. They've got a place under county government for taxes, and then they've got a place for business extensions and then you're able to apply for an extension on up to April 15th or May 15th for your company or, or your individual. And they automatically, almost automatically, will give you the extension. Then you're able to wait for your accountant or your bookkeeper to give you your, your paperwork back. So you got that depreciation list. You can fill out the county tax uh, return and send it on in. But what I want... Okay, Cheryl's giving me some information. I was sitting here stuttering, Cheryl. Uh, the date for, for listing the taxes is is the end of January. 
or the 1st of January. I think it's the end of January to 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 have that uh, that list in back end. As you know, we better double check that. I'm, I'm not positive on it. Uh, so tomorrow night I'll have the answer for you. Thank you for bringing that up. But in my mind, it's the end of January. But still, as businesses, we're always going to have to get an extension or, or automatically pay the 10%. Thanks for bringing that up, Cheryl. She sent that to me in, uh, in chat. Okay, any questions about the county taxes? Ask them away. Let's stay away, if we can, from audits. Audits make our stomachs turn inside out and tie us up in knots because it's scary to have a professional come in and look at book work that we're all kind of in question about as we've done it for years. So as when we can avoid that, it's a good thing. Uh, I've had the privilege to, to live through two of them so far. Uh, thought I was going to have a Howard tax on both of them, but made, made them both out without being hurt too badly. Uh, usually 1% of all returns are audited. That's feds. I don't know about the state. But uh, I understand that IRS is bringing on a lot new and more employees, hopefully to look at the big boys and not at uh, little guys like you and I, but still there are going to be more people doing audits, so that may go up to 2%. But we want to stay away and do our best not to send flags up. Red flags where we're waving, hey, look at me, I want you to audit me. And there's some ways that you can do that. The first way is using those shady preparers that we talked about. Stay away from them and you will, you will have a whole lot less chance of being audited. If you're using a CPA to do your audits, I mean your returns, that's a good way to lower the flags too. Because those audits are, I mean, those returns are audited less. Make sure that you don't go wild with your unreported income. I know we all want to stay under the radar and make cash and not report it, and it's an underground economy. But you're a business person now, and you're going to want someday to, to have a large business that's showing a profit so that you can borrow money and grow it so that you can uh, enlarge your company and, and be legal all the way and not be afraid of someone coming in uh, checking out what your values are. So as you're making money, go ahead and plan to report it, pay the taxes on it. As new business people, your chances of having to pay a lot of tax are really slim. And if you do, that's a good problem to have. That means you've you got a good business going on and you're managing it well if you're making that money. Go ahead and file your taxes on time because those that get extensions every year without having a good reason or, or, or just seem to be shady operators, every year someone getting that extension is, is not a good thing. If your extension is being filed by a CPA, that's just fine. They've always got a good reason that, that it can be done and they'll back it up. But other folks that are, are not filing those taxes, uh, maybe trying to dodge the payments that are due or whatever, so they're just not doing it on time, that's a flag going up. Putting a circle around all the dots now. We've been together here for seven weeks, and we want to talk about just one thing now. Summarize it. If you're offering just take it or leave it in the way that you're presenting your business, there's a good chance your customers are going to leave it. So you want to say things, let's negotiate, give them different ways to pay. Give your customers some options. Give them a reason to talk to you about the price and what they can do to, to make it fit uh, their budget or their situation. Remember, we have to have those raving fan customers for sustainability. You can't show me a company that's been in business a long time that hadn't got a customer base. That's right. We've got to earn that customer base. So follow up with your customers as you're doing business with them. Make sure that they feel good about doing business and they're referring other people to you. Referring other people to you. It's a big, big part of it. Start right now creating a database of your potential customers. Just like you guys know that I've got your name and your email address on a list, and all I've got to do is copy that list and everybody gets an email from me. I want you all to be able to do that too for your business. Now, next week, I'm going to send you some examples of what I'm doing for my fall campaigns. Not that I expect you to buy hay balers or anything from me. I know that's not in your business. But I'm sending these to you 
just to show you how you can do promotions and use your videos and use your database to help you create sales for the fall season. That's, that's what I'm after now. If I'm going to have sales in March, April, and May of next year, I need to be planting those seeds now. So you may be wondering, why is Steve doing all this advertising in the winter when people aren't buying? I'm doing it to plant the seeds for Raven Fan customers for next spring. Because a lot of people will go ahead and make the decision to buy now, even though they don't actually write the check until next year. Please get that Google My Business a profile account. It can be so important for you. Please look at your at, look at your mobile page. It is so important for your business. Uh, th thinking, uh -oh, where did that come from? Take a break here. Think about your landing pages. Let's work on those during the, the winter months. Get some testimonials. Now, as, as y'all graduate uh, from these series and become members of the academy, and you want a testimonial from me uh, as a business coach and uh, founder of the academy, I'll write a testimonial for you that you can put right on your web page and in your resume. Be glad to do it. So I want you to have testimonials to help be in confidence. And videos are number one on a priority for you, number one. And, and uh, this is a chance that uh, some of you have done, but most of you have not got around to sending me that video, and it is so important that you do it. Now, maybe you've got a good reason not to, and if you have, I understand it. But I can tell you there's a million good reasons to go ahead and get used to making the videos, and I'll be glad to help you. Uh, Beth's going to testify to that, and, and uh, you, you just got to do it if you want to be in the game. If you want to... Uh, Get out of the bleachers and get down on the field and get in the game, my friends. Get your telephones out and your cameras out and start learning how to make YouTube videos, and I'll show you how to enhance them into nice commercials, okay? That's the promise I'm making for you. Remember in week three that we talked the magic marketing moment because that was the end of our marketing, our, our marketing plan. That's where it all came together. When you're able to to have a magic marketing moment, that means you're able to talk with your customer and get information from them when they don't buy something else, when they want their next appointment, uh, when this, when that, because you need that information to plan your future strategy. All of us need to be doing that every time we have a chance to speak with a customer. The magic marketing moment is the key to your sustainability and, more importantly, your ability to lay your head down on the pillow. Now, I want to tell you, each one of you, some of you are already into it, but when you start in a position to have YouTube uh, uh, videos going out to your database, when you're able to start doing Facebook campaigns which uh, and, and, and send this information out, you will start getting business. Yeah, it, it's, it's not rocket science. You send out the right stuff, and people are buying it, then you can be a business person like anyone else can. So you got my support and just an encouragement to give it a try. Now, a number of years ago, you may have been in high school. And if you were going to take something related to business courses and selling, then you would be in a class we call maybe Sales 101. And then as you got interested or went to college, you might have got up to Sales 202. And maybe you even went to master's. You got your business degree, your BA degree as a master's business uh, administration there. In that case, you might have got 202 or maybe 302, 303 in sales. But now I'm talking to you about sales 404. This is what is way past the fundamentals. This is getting right down to the nitty-gritty when you've got a customer that's got the money in their pocket or the ability to, 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 to say yes, to buy something from you or to commit, commit to something, and you're talking to them and negotiating with them or trying to build up to the point that you can do that, and the little things that you do or what we'll call the strategies can make all the difference in the world. So it gets back to that what we said last week. 
it really doesn't make a lot of difference on how much you uh, uh, know. It's how much you care about your your profession and how good you want to be at this. So let's kind of focus on now moving the side of the marketing, moving the side of the administrative bookkeeping, uh, moving the side of the personnel issues, moving the side of trying to fund our business. And now we need to boil it down to what every entrepreneur must know and must feel and must feel good about to move forward to up, up that ladder to sales 404 with confidence. I want to give you some ideas that I put together over a period of years that I think make a world of difference. First of all, it's mindset. When we're moving into a, a deal closing situation, our mind needs to be all A, B, C, which is, I, I say, stands for always be closing. This is an old saying that's been used in the real estate uh, profession forever. They're always about closing the deal, right? Well, we have to be that way the same way. So it's ABC as a professional sales 404 business people. No matter how good our videos are and presentations are, they're all building up to, if people don't trust you, they're not going to buy from you. So we've got to build that trust. That was why it was so important with Beth to have that great video that she did. And she did it time and time again because she really not the home run with it. With great flowers, a good presentation, good photos, went the extra mile to make this happen. Uh, building trust is uh, is important. And it's not how pretty you are like Beth is or how ugly you are like I am. I, I know I'm not. Uh, I, my face isn't built for videos. It might be built for radio. But it makes no difference because you just got to be yourself. For me to sell a, a expensive equipment to a gentleman in California that I've never met, today I got an order from the largest walnut growing company in the whole world in California for a $6,000 piece of equipment. And I'd exchanged emails and such as back five times with this people, not nine times, but five times. I know that the reason I didn't have to go 9, 10, or 11 times is because we had good videos and good presentations. I want you to be able to enjoy that too. So you, you get people to trust you by being transparent, and videos is a good way to do that, and testimonials is a good way to do that. But more than anything else, it's your ability to speak or look them in the eye and for them not to say, to themselves, and we all know how to do this. We'll talk to somebody, and 10 seconds into a conversation, we have already sized them up as a scammer or a cheat or somebody you never want to have at your kitchen table. Isn't it amazing how fast that we can we can uh, draw those conclusions? And I know sometimes we make mistakes. But in our business, my friends, as entrepreneurs, those mistakes are going to cost us business. So we got to learn how to earn trust. Uh, and you do that by the way you talk and look at people in the eye sometimes and the things that you say. So let's think about this. This is a face-to-face. -face. And is it okay for you to take a cell phone call while you're taking talking to a customer about a deal? Man, it goes on every day. Hey, I got a call. I need to take this. This is important. Give me just a minute and walk over here and start talking. <clears throat> we see it every day, don't we? Well, Papo Stevo is here to tell you as your business coach, don't do it. If you are working a customer and you're talking with them about business or about something personal, but because that is important to your business, creating that relationship, and you have an incoming call, then it is exactly that. It's an incoming call that's trying to interrupt you or to have you distract from what you need to do. Remember our conversations a few weeks ago when I said your biggest enemy in business now is our personal distractions? Well, I need to redo that for the next series because one of our worst distractions is that cotton-picking cell phone right there. Because 
if we're not careful, it will get us to leave a customer in the dark while we go talk with someone on the phone. Don't do it. And people will do it to you. I want you to remember this. When they're doing it to you, maybe they had not had this lesson and they're not cheating you. I know that you're not trying to hurt their feelings, but you are hurting a relationship anytime you break it off to answer a sales call. When you let it ring and you look at it and you look up at that customer and say, oh, I'll, this is important, but you're more important. Let's you and I do some business. Then you're going up with the value of your relationship. Now, some of us old fellas like Old Spice, and some of us like Aqua Velvet, and some of us like the Musk this and something other than that. Some of us like to put on aftershave like it's uh, putting water on our face, and it just stinks. Uh, my wife tells me sometimes when I put too much on, you stink, you need to go wipe some of that off. And some ladies like to juice it up as well, right? Well, I want to tell you, know that this customer that you're trying to do business with may be offended by that odor. It may be making them sick on their stomach. You have to know and ask someone, hey, is this too strong? Do I need to tone this down a little bit? Because if someone, that one person in a hundred that you're trying to sell or, or contract with may be very, very important to the future of your business, and because you smell to high heaven, uh, maybe you got... Uh, maybe you're a smoker, and let me tell you now, having been around smokers most of my adult life, before I quit when I was 40 years old, I didn't smell smoke on other people, but let me tell you, the minute I stopped smoking, sometimes people, friends of mine, who think they're clean and, and, and cool, stink to high heaven with tobacco smoke. And at times, if I've got my allergies going on, it makes me want to throw up. And I can't hardly smell. I can imagine what it is with some people that are very sensitive. So smokers, listen to me. Papo Stevo is preaching here to you. Quit smoking. Do what you got to do to quit smoking because it's going to cost you some sales, not, a, not have anything to do with how many years it may cost you off your life. And all those years you're not going to be able to be with your children or see your daughters or your sons graduate from school or college or grandchildren, do yourself a favor and quit smoking. It's good for business. When you don't have tobacco smoke on you and you're walking into most of the people in the world today in the business world do not smoke, and you walk up to them and you're not bringing that aroma that turns them off, there's an excellent chance they'll be more attentive to your what you have to say rather than sitting there trying to listen to you and trying to be nice. But what's really on their mind is not what you're saying. It's how cotton-picking bad you stink. Forgive the French here, but this is 404. There's no time here to pull punches. Don't bring your pets into someone's private office. Some folks don't like pets. I mean, Norm and I have, now we've got five cats running around outside and two cats inside and a dog, I've learned to live with pets. But a lot of people don't plan to live with pets and don't want to. They're allergic to them or they just don't want to be around the friendliest dog in the world. So as a professional salesman, you owe it to yourself, your company, and your employees and your future to leave the pets out of your business. Now, if you've got a customer that loves your dog or something like that, it's a whole different story. But don't take risks when you don't have to take them. Bad, bad things to do. And man, right here two weeks before the uh, midterm elections and in the middle of football season, the professional salesmen don't, don't play politics. No. The professional salesman don't have a favorite football team that he puts it in somebody else's face who may hate them. And especially, we're going to leave presidential politics out of the game when you're trying to work with a customer. Because half this country likes somebody, and the other half likes somebody else, and there's not any room in between. Are you ready to give up your chance to sell half of the people? I'm not. Now, I am a devout politician. <laughs> 
<laughs> I've voted for the same party all my life and probably will continue to do that. And it's okay with me for the people on the other side to do the same thing because I'll just cancel out their vote. But that's my business, and I'll keep it to myself. I will say that I'm proud to be American, and I say God bless America every day I can. I'm all about helping veterans and people that can't help themselves. I do think we need to welcome immigrants into America, but I think we need to do it legally. But that's my opinion. That's middle-of-the-ground type stuff. Yeah, so try to try to tone it down if if you're one of those who likes to just throw out comments about how much you hate somebody or the problem we're having in America today is somebody's fault or somebody else's, because over half of the, or at least half of the people that you mentioned that to are going to disagree with you big time, and I don't want that inability to keep your business to yourself or close to your chest to hurt your business. Because it will do it, especially in the day's world. You know, 20 years ago, it was not the case. Nothing like it is now. And it seems to be getting worse. So as a business coach, speaking with new entrepreneurs, I really need to mention this to you. Uh, Madison, you, you're out there in a world where this is so confusing and so big time real because uh, people that you serve with and that you will be serving now, they got deep feelings on both sides. So you want to make sure that you're you're in the middle of the road on this thing and, and let them go their way and you do business, okay? And that's true with most everybody. So please keep that in mind. Religion, same thing, same thing. I'm a Methodist. I'm proud of it. I'm not proud of everything the Methodist Church does. I enjoy going to the, fund, uh, to the uh, non-denominational church down in Elizabethtown. I love the preaching and I love the music. And I love the fact that he, that at noontime we're out of there. And I love the fact that uh, that uh, he don't preach politics. But that's my business. I'm not going to try to force it on anybody else's. I enjoy going to some other churches as well. But when I'm talking business, I don't mention it. When you walk into someone's private office, and they're on the phone, even though the door was open, and you you find yourself inside that office, and they're on the phone. Do you just take a seat and sit there and listen to one side of the conversation? Most of us would. Even sometimes I found myself ready to walk out of that situation, and the person that was on the phone said, oh, come on, Steve, sit down. I'll just be a minute. Don't do that. Every time that you get a chance to say to the person that's on the phone, I'll be right over here till you're finished. Even as they say, that's okay. You get out of earshot. Why? When someone's on the phone talking with anybody else, you don't ever know when something may come up in that conversation that's none of your business. And the person would like to respond, and they have to monitor or change the way they would respond because you're there listening. Now, you don't have that right. I don't have that right. What is the right thing to do is for you to say, okay, I'll be right over here, and you just get out of earshot. And they may they, they may say, that's not necessary. That's silly. I had never seen anybody do that before. But they will be thinking, wow, that was a super courteous thing for him to do or for her to do. Maybe I wasn't worried about my privacy, but they were. What is the hidden message in that? The hidden message is you care enough to make a, 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 a noticeable change in your behavior so that they can enjoy their privacy. That is automatically an up in your relationship, and it, it will make a difference. Those little things like that make a lot of difference and, and create a confidence uh, with people. Don't ever take for granted that the deal is yours. Just because you've done business with this person a long time or they are a friend, don't take for granted that because you've given them a quote that you're going to get the order. The smart business person always follows up as often as necessary to stay in the game. Once you hand them the quotation and you walk away and you go get back in the stands and you get off the field, then 
the chances of you getting that deal go down big time. Remember to stay in the game. When you put your quotation in that customer's hands, that's like you've passed the ball to them. That doesn't mean you're going to leave the ball field. It means you're going to stand back maybe and give them time to consider it a reasonable amount of time, but no more than a reasonable amount of time before you're back there saying, you got any questions about that? Man, I sure would like to take your order home today. I don't want you to bug them, but I do want you to send them a definite message that you're in the game and you're really concerned about getting this order and you're hungry. You are hungry. Be proud of being a young entrepreneur that's hungry. Let them know that when they give you the order, you're going to be a happy camper. Yes, it will be a good day for both of you because people want to help folks that are hungry. Don't ever forget that. No matter how successful we are and how many orders we're taking, I have some weeks sometimes when I really get a lot of orders, but I have to keep myself pinned down. I have to dampen down not to let that out to the customer because I want each and every one of them that I'm talking to them thinking that they, you sure are making my day. This is wonderful. I was hoping I could get this order today. Folks like to hear that. Folks will call you back so they can hear it again. Be hungry and be appreciative. Big, big deal. This is fast times. People are urgent. You got to, if you get a call, answer that call in a hurry. Check your email every day. Stay in touch with them. Now, I want to tell you that some people have a hard time, have a hard time uh, wanting to uh, do business with you. They want to do it, but I don't want you to tell them their vendors' names. I don't want you to give away any information that you don't have to. And I want you to remember that some people have a hard time in saying, yes, I'll take it, Steve. Yes, I want it. It's hard to verbalize. So I've mentioned uh, in last week, it's important that you learn to read and to send nonverbal communications. It's really important because some people just can't do it. And they even look like this little girl. Instead of giving you their money, even though they want to buy this thing, they really are enjoying having that money in the bank, and it's a hard thing to say yes. So how do you, how do you move them into that? First of all, I want your work to be a work of art. Have all your documents prepared. Do everything you can, like we talked about last week, in forecasting and ready to negotiate. Your documents need to be a work of art where you've got everything looking good, not a bunch of scribble, but things written out nicely. You ever heard of this fellow, Dr. Mesmer? What did we learn from him? Mesmerize. Because the professional salesman, at the end of the day, when it's time to close the deal, after all that other stuff is passed, and we've got the customer ready to buy, and things are looking good, we're going to think about how we can mesmerize them for a few seconds. And what does mesmerize mean? It's all the things that add up to almost like hypnotizing. Yeah, it's getting their attention and holding on to it, because we are in a drama when you're in the closing situation. It's just like on a stage or just like at church when the preacher has just the right sounds. He's got the choir singing the right, the right hymns. And, and he knows how to nail it down and how to speak to make his point with certain scriptures and, and, and to make it happen right down to the end of the service when he's doing that altar call that he's got your attention and convinced you that today is a good day to be saved. Well, a good salesman, he's going to approach that stuff kind of the same way. You don't have your ducks lined up, and you don't have your documents looking good, and you will have practiced in this drama just like an actor on Broadway to, to know how this uh, will work. You've anticipated the questions that they're going to ask you and answered them because you want to be a professional. You want to make it happen. And what we're after is the aha moment. Take a moment now and think about when you were a child or you were ha having your first children or watching your brothers and the sisters as they were growing up crying in the middle of the night and your parent was rocking them back and forth, just rocking that baby, trying to get it to go to sleep. Even take it in a car and drive around the block so they go to sleep. Man, that child just would not hush and it was getting over close to 3 o'clock in the morning and then all of a sudden the baby just quit crying and looked up at him. Or looked up at you with that three-pointed smile and said, <gasps> closed her eyes and went to sleep. 
That happens. Yeah. <clears throat> you have done all you can with this customer. You you sold them. You told them all the things they need to know. You've answered all the questions, just like rocking that baby. But they just keep coming at you with all these reasons they can't buy, with all these reasons that your machine's not good enough, that you hadn't sold me all I need, all I need it. But you have finally, you have finally got it to the point. You have finally got it to the point that they like you, that they're trusting you, and you had to work hard to get to this point. You convinced them that they really need to buy from you. Uh, you've convinced them that the price is right. It may not be the lowest price, but it's the best value because of the value added things that you've done it. And you've even convinced them how comfortable they're going to be after they buy this product and feel good about operating it. Oh, you're going to look so good on that lawnmower uh, out in the front yard of you. You're just going to ride up and down and feel so proud. And when people ride by, you're going to wave at them and just be very proud of what you got here because it's the best-looking lawnmower in the whole county. And you know that it's going to look good, and you, you feel good about the reputation of it. You know, you know, slow your breathing down, and you know, lower your voice down, and you don't start shaking your head like this as you make one point and use gestures here and gestures there, and you know, shake your head like this and get their attention, look them right in the eye. I mean, look, take your glasses off and look them right in the eye to convince them that this is the right time and place. And you're going to like this. And you will find yourself when you lower your voice down to get their attention. Maybe have some silent periods of time to make sure that they're listening to you. And you don't say, now right here is the amount that we did. Here's our money that we've agreed on. I'm going to initial it here. How about just initial it and let's do that deal. And either they send Okay, I'll, I'll, they don't say it, but they'll reach over and initial it, or they'll reach up and shake your hand because you've been doing your head like this all along. And when you're good at this, you will notice that they're starting to do their head like this too. And that is a buying signal that you automatically move to do a handshake. And you get the deal, and nobody ever said, I'll take it. Because some people have a tremendous hard time saying, I'll take it. A lot of people do. It's a lot easier to close the deal with nonverbal communications and sincerity and relationship and looking people in the eye than it is to make them verbalize, I'll do the deal. See what I'm saying? And when you can do that, you know they have lost their anxieties and they're ready to do and everybody breathes business and they buy from you. They actually help you close the sale by doing that. Practice it. Think about it. Look at the mirror sometimes when you're giving your sales point, how to talk and look, and sometimes just shake your head and lower your voice. So like, like, this is so important, I want it really to sink in. Congratulations. I think you're ready to jump out there, be the quarterback, and win some football games, win some business deals. The key to your success and sustainability is not making a billion dollars. It's not being the most profitable guy on the, in, the, in the book. It's making profit, a little bit of profit, being sustainable, and staying in the race. The way you win this race of, of uh, entrepreneurship is to stay in the race. Because year after year, you'll have good ones and bad ones. But you'll get smarter, and you'll learn more, and you'll you'll be able to to uh, to grow your business with a solid base of raving fan customers. Finishing the journey is is quite a quite a feat. I'm still on my journey, and I've been at it a long time, and I'm not planning on stopping. I'm just getting warmed up with you guys, and looking forward to helping you come along the way. Let's think about some values now. I want you to respect every person, maintain high standards, earn the trust of people, foster partnerships, and embrace excellence. Don't settle for mediocrity. Let your light shine. Be proud of what you're doing. Show the way for other people. I want to say to you and, uh, and your family, uh, 
You are now a part of the Academy of Entrepreneurs and Associates. Those of you who have attended this class, and I appreciate it and welcome you to it. You are as good, uh, as much a member of the Academy as I am because we're all in it to uh, help other people have better businesses. So I want to invite you to come back and come back and come back and invite other people to do it. Uh, we're always going to have uh, classes about this large probably, but the key is we make more and more friends and acquaintances as we go. But you are the Academy, so when I send you an email, it's coming from your organization now. Uh, you are welcome uh, not to uh, go lazy on me through November. Uh, attend the next four Tuesday nights, and I'll have some lessons on things we haven't talked about yet. And then in January, mid-January, we'll crank right back up with another seven-part and five-part series and do it all again. And if you tell me how we can improve it, we'll make changes in it to suit your needs as well. So thank you all. I'm going to put the uh, uh, invite you to put your uh, videos on or your mics on, and any comments that you have, we'll certainly welcome them. Thank you all for uh, being a part of this. Does anyone have anything they'd like to say as we uh, uh, call it a night? All right. Well, I can usually count on Patrice, but there you are. I knew you'd come in. <laughs> Thank you so much. Very informative and lots of useful information. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Patrice, and I appreciate you coming in to the uh, to the live face-to-face uh, -face sessions that we have, and we'll be doing those again in uh, in January and February too. So I'd like to see more of you come over to James Keenan, and uh, we'll have a a face-to-face -face, uh, chance to to meet and to chit chat. Thanks again. All right, I don't see anyone else that's coming on board. Thank you again. Send those uh, send those tests in to me, those quizzes. That you would need those to qualify you to get your certificates. Also, remember there's the five profit centers and your videos, uh, redoing the 40 drill skills. There's a lot of ways you can get your uh, your uh, extra uh, ex extra effort awards. So we've got lots of certificates, and we'd like to send them out to you. Okay, good night, everybody. God bless you and your families. Hope to see you next week.